out of town that will already tell us that they're coming. And so we're expecting a really good crowd that night, so make sure you're here. It's going to be a really good opportunity for you to sit back and relax and enjoy a free concert. That'll be on the 14th. Uh, on the 21st, this is kind of big too, on January 21st, we're starting a financial peace class. So if you know Dave Ramsey, uh, we're going to be starting one of his classes uh, right here at the church at 3 p.m. starting January 21st. And so if you're if you're like me and you don't do well budgeting money and uh, money is, is tight all the time and, and you'd like to know how to uh, save some money and, and uh you know, be good stewards with your money. Make sure you sign up for this class. You can do that out in the lobby, January 21st, starting at 3 p.m. Uh, we had so many financial needs in December from people. It was almost overwhelming. And so, <laughs> you ever heard the saying, <laughs> give a man a fish, you'll feed him for a day. Teach a man a fish, you'll feed him for a lifetime. That's what we're hoping to do. And we're going to teach some people how to budget their, their money, and hopefully uh, it'll change some lives in the process. Uh, but listen, here's some exciting things. I'm not giving you dates, but it's going to give you some things to look forward to. We're having a membership class in March. We're having a life action revival in March. We have Easter coming up in March. We have our Night to Shine in February. We have, uh, we're launching small groups in April. So we have a lot of great things happening at the very beginning of 2024 that we want you to be in prayer for. Uh, one of the things about the life action revival that is a group of, of, of people that come to our church, they'll lead our worship, they'll preach, they'll uh, lead our kids in youth ministry all at the same time for four nights. And so we want to encourage you to be here, but also be in prayer because next week we're going to be looking for people to house them. We need people, we need church members to house them. So if you got extra room in your house and wouldn't mind uh, housing some of these, these young adults, if you'll do that, we'll appreciate it. Number two, we're also looking for a logistics coordinator who will be the middle person. With, from, for, for our church and to them. And so uh, if you're interested in doing something like that, let me know. That way, when, when y'all forget them in the church and they need to talk to somebody, they'll call the logistics coordinator and they don't have to bother me. Does that make sense? <laughs> All right, good. Uh, listen, it's a new year, so I'm going I'm to do this. I'm going to challenge you with this. It's a new year. Get plugged into the church. Amen. We have amazing, Amen. amazing Sunday school classes uh, here at 1015. Uh, I teach a class here. We have two more adult classes in the fellowship hall. We have classes for all ages in the fellowship hall. Amen. And so get plugged in the new in this new year for our, from our Sunday school perspective. Also get plugged in on, at our uh, midweek services. We have a service here every Wednesday night at 6.30. Uh, I lead that as well. And so come join us and get that midweek pickup uh, to encourage you and, and get you, uh, you know, I don't know. I love it. It's one of my favorite, favorite nights of the week. Uh, our Kids on the Move meets on Wednesday nights, and then our, our youth. If your youth's not plugged into our Youth on the Move on Friday nights, you got, you got to get them plugged in. Uh, it's one of the fastest growing youth groups in Northern Kentucky, so make sure you get them here Friday nights, 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, but get plugged in. We have a lot of cool things happening at the church, and we want you to be all in with what God has in store for you. So I'm going to ask Brian to give you some word of prayer as we pick up our last offering of the year. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, Lord, that we're allowed again to come to you and worship you with our giving. And Father, as we look back over the great things that have happened in 2023, we give you thanks. We give you praise. We give you honor and glory, Lord, for those that have been saved, lives that have been changed, people saved, healed, delivered, set free, and redeemed right here because of the ministry of this place, which was accomplished through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, the, the faithful giving of your children and the great pastoral leadership of this place. And Father, as we look into 2024, you laid out a plan for us. You told us that if we would humble ourselves, if we would pray, if we would seek your face, that you would hear, turn from our wicked ways, Lord, you told us that you would hear from heaven and heal our land. God, we ask you to use Trinity to do just that, to heal this land, this community, and beyond like never before. Let great things be accomplished this next year. God, we give you the glory, we give you the praise, and we give you the honor. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
tonight. Listen to this, church. Tonight, you are still a Christian. We don't take off our Christian hat to party on New Year's Eve. You are still a Christian tonight, and I pray that, that you're like me. We remember all that God has done this past year and celebrate what God is going to do in the future. And as a church, we're excited about 2024. Uh, we're excited what God is going to do through our church. We have some exciting things that are happening uh, in our church. But let me tell you something. We cannot do it alone. And so we're asking you to be all in in 2024. It's going to take some commitment from the one sitting in this room. It's going to take some sacrifices and more than that, it's going to take us to be all in to truly see God's work in a way that we could, uh, couldn't even ask or imagine. And uh, again, I'm going to unashamedly plug the uh, next week's uh, sermon because it's, I think it's super important for you to be here. Next week, it's our State of the, Youth, our State of the Church address. It's our Vision Sunday. We're going to be passing out uh, some stickers for everybody to uh, pray for our baptisms for the new year. We're also going to be talking about some of the demographic numbers of Pendleton County. I think there are some of the most uh, encouraging numbers that I've seen in a long time, but they're also eye-opening. And so I hope that you're here uh, next week so we can talk about that. Our goal as a church is to be a church on the move dedicated to the ministry of Jesus Christ. And uh, we have to understand this. Church is more than just showing up. Right? It's more than just showing up on Sundays and, and that's it. Church is volunteering. Church is serving. Church is helping those in need. And as we grow, we need to, we need to, uh, we need, we need to show up, not just on Sunday, but we need to move into roles, especially for some of y'all have been here for like five years. Y'all got to move into roles where you're serving people and make some room for the lost people that need to get in here and uh, become, I guess, spectators, I guess you want to call it that. So if you have your Bibles, turn me to the 105th Psalm, verses 1 through 5. 105th Psalm, verses 1 through 5. As you turn there, I want to uh, share, as you turn to 105, I want to share uh, a, a piece of scripture that I, 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 stu I was studying this week that I, it kind of just stuck out to me. And that was in uh, Luke chapter 2, after Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph take Jesus to Jerusalem to to the temple to offer a sacrifice. Uh, the sacrifice was, oddly enough, two turtle doves and a partridge in a pear tree. It wasn't a partridge, but it was two turtle doves. How funny is that? And uh, the, this man that was at this temple, his name was Simeon, he takes Jesus and he blessed him. And one of the things he said that was so profound, he says, he says to Jesus, he said, my eyes have seen your salvation. And I thought, man, Simeon is, is, is saying this without seeing any miracles that Jesus performed. He is saying this without, without hearing the reputation of Jesus as someone who can read the thought of man. He is saying this without seeing him dying on a cross, being put in a borrowed tomb, raised from the dead. He is saying all these things without seeing any of the things that, that we feel like we have to see in order to, to uh, follow Christ. It's, it's one of the most incredible, his response to Jesus is the response we see all throughout the Bible to the goodness of our Lord. And it made me think, what is your response to Jesus? When you hear about Jesus, what is your response to Jesus? I truly believe some of you think Jesus is a genie in a bottle. And he's just here to grant your three wishes when you need something. I think for others of, of, that are here, I think you believe Jesus is just a healer. And so you only go to God when you need a healing from, from a health problem that you have created yourself after years of sinful and bad habits. For others, Jesus is just a formality. You show up to church, go through the motions of church, and hopefully you can avoid hell in the process. But our response should be like the countless people in the Bible. It should be a response of joy and thankfulness it should be a response of holy surrender, which should be reflected in everything that we do. Amen. If you got to serve, you better do it with joyfulness and thankfulness and holy surrender. You know what I'm saying? If you got to open the door for somebody, you do it with thankfulness and joy and holy surrender. This is what we're going to see today through the words of God's servant David. A change in our attitude. Especially if you're going to sit there and call yourself a Christian. If you're going to sit there and call yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, then there, there's got to be an attitude change happening inside of the Christian. You know what I'm saying? And the church should be the first place this attitude should happen. Okay? So if you claim to follow Christ or he's in your heart and you are bitter and cold and angry and hateful, then you're blaspheming about who God is. Because you can't sit there and claim you got Christ in your heart, but you have so much hate. 
doesn't, doesn't, doesn't equate. You know what I'm saying? God is love. He ain't hate. So how are you going to sit there and have hate in your heart and then sit there and claim you have Christ? Doesn't make sense. So uh, let's look at Psalm 105, 1 through 5. Let's all stand for reading this holy word. Here's what God's word says. Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make his deeds known among the people. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonders. Boast in his holy name. May the heart of those who seek the Lord be joyful. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Remember his wonders which he has done, his marvels and the judgment spoken by his mouth. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Before you sit down, uh, tell somebody next to you what your biggest plans are for New Year's Eve. <laughs> couldn't tell the person sitting next to you, then you probably shouldn't do it, okay? Just remember that. <laughs> Today is uh, the end of another year, and this is, uh, I, 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 did, I told my Sunday school class this, this is the last service of the year. And, and that was the last, you know, scripture that we're going to focus on. This is it. This is the last one of the year. Tonight, I'm going to have my last piece of bacon for the year. <laughs> Tomorrow, I'll have it first. Amen? Uh, but to, here's what my challenge is going to be for this church. To, to sing a new song. To have a different attitude. To look at life through uh, the lens of Jesus instead of the lens of this world or through your own lenses. In, the, in, in this passage we're looking at this morning, there's three things that I just want to pull straight from this passage that I believe will encourage you but also give you a different perspective in our lives. And the first thing that we see is David's call for us to boast in his holy name, to give thanks for all that he has done, to make his deeds known among the people. Church, I wish we could understand this. Grasp this. Do this every single day of our life. There's a pastor that I follow on social media. He said, look, there's all these complaining going on in the world. There's all this uh, bickering and debating going on on social media. He has all of his followers just to share pictures of their, of their Christmas Eve service from last Sunday. And in the comments were all of these beautiful pictures of beautiful churches and just filled with people celebrating God, the birth of Jesus. And I thought, man... I, I, I was scrolling through it. I just thought, how beautiful is this? We don't see this anymore. Of people just celebrating how beautiful it is for God's people to get together and praise God. It's one of the most beautiful things. One of the things that I actually miss, this is the only thing, to be honest with you, the only thing I missed from 2020. Because when COVID hit, you know what all the churches started to do? They all started to post on social media, all of them. They started to share their, 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 their uh, sermons on social media. People would share and discuss things on social media. It's one of the things I miss because, like, the world is so loud about the dumbest things, and yet we are sitting here on the greatest thing in the world. We don't want to tell anybody. We have missed the bar when it comes to boasting in the Lord. We have been sold that the, the humble attitude of a Christian is a quiet attitude. Right. We, we, have been, we have confused humility with timidness. And I could not imagine in, in my life, I could not imagine being married to my wife and, and never wearing a wedding ring because I don't want to brag about our relationship. I could not imagine sitting there being, being married to my wife and, and never wanting to take a picture with her because I never want to brag about her. You know what I'm saying? Oh, don't take a picture with me, Becky, because I don't want to brag that I got you. You know? Never telling her I love her in public. Never wanting to hold her hand. Never wanting to even get married. Never wanting to get her gifts because I don't want to brag about my wife. I, I just, how is that possible? You know what I'm saying? What the world know I love my wife? Amen. I want to brag about my wife. She's beautiful. Gorgeous. Amen. In Sunday school, I made a joke. <laughs> in order, <laughs> I shouldn't even say it, but I'm going to because... In order for God to, when God created man, well, when God created a woman, he took man's rib. Amen. And I, I said, women have been a pain in our side ever since. <laughs> Not good. So just give me a second, because I got to declare my love for my wife, because I got in a lot of trouble after Sunday school. So 
love my wife. She's beautiful. I don't know what I would do without her. Praise God. Amen. But what, what kind of relationship is that if I sit there and never want anybody to know about my wife or, or even know that she exists because I don't want to sound like I'm bragging about it? You know what I'm saying? How stupid is that? So why in the world are we doing this with Jesus? Why do we keep Jesus a secret? Until my dying breath, I am going to boast about God. I'm going to boast about what God is doing in my life. We have to hear you boast about the presence your kids got last week. Look at all, look at the PlayStation 5. What? When I was a kid, we got a stick. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, pick up sticks. Great game, you throw them on the floor. Pick them up. They thought they were smart. Unbelievable. Then they played, what was that, 52 card pickup? Is that what they call that? 52 card pickup? That was a fun game, too. You just throw the cards and then you got to pick them up. Stupid. So we got to we listen to you, right? About all the, all the presents your kids got for Christmas, but I can't talk about God. We, we got to sit there and listen to, to uh, you know, we have to share a picture of what you, you ate every night for dinner. There's only four restaurants in, in town. We get it. Pizza or a burger. Or more pizza. Or more pizza. Or Mexican if you're feeling good. You know what I'm saying? But I can't talk about God. We have to sit there and listen to you, all you grandparents, man. I got to listen to grandparents talk about how great their grandkids are, how they're the, they're the greatest kids on the face of the earth, even though most of them are punks. But I got to listen to you talk about your grandkids, and I can't talk about Jesus. Are you kidding me? Why in the world would I not boast about God and what he's done in my life? Because what God has done in my life is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me in my life. I want to tell everybody about it. I'm saved. I'm redeemed. I am forever set free. And I became our song. And sing about the goodness of God. Psalm 96, 1 through 6 says, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and great is to be praised. He is to be feared of all gods. For all gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. I have heard so many megachurch pastors use this verse, these verses, to justify singing modern music. They'll say, see? It says sing a new song. So we got to sing the latest song. And so we're going to sing all these big, great worship songs. And people have no idea the evil behind the money-making machine that is contemporary music. Hillsong, Hillsong, big old church, Hillsong, they, they had a worship leader who faked having cancer so one of his songs would get picked up on the, on the radio. He, he would even play with, with an oxygen mask on, and he'd be playing, trying to get people to, and churches still play that song, and they don't think, you don't even know what you're saying. They got a sign behind this stuff to hit the right chords to make sure that you hit the emotional chords so you're crying as soon as they start playing their song. It is manipulative. It is insane. And, and it's just to sell, it's just to sell music. And here's the thing you have to understand. This is why hermeneutics is important. This is why context is important. David isn't saying it's time for us to sing more modern songs because the old songs about Jesus are old and outdated. Can I be honest with you? Jesus never gets outdated when you're singing to him. I don't care what the song is. But here's what David means when he says, sing a new song. He is saying, we have sung our songs of depression. We have sung our songs of grief. We have sung our songs of crying out. We have sung our songs of help and healing. He says, now it's time to sing a new song, a song of praise, a song of joy, and a song of rejoicing. Amen. Amen. Because just a few chapters before this, David was singing this kind of song to God. He says this. He said, I've cried out day and then night before you. He says, God, let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry, for my soul has had enough troubles. He says, God, I'm counted among those who go down to the pit. I have become like a man without strength, abandoned among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave who you no longer remember. And they are cut off from your hand. God, you put me in the lowest pit in dark places in the depths. 
Your wrath has rested upon me, and you have afflicted me with all your ways. You have removed my acquaintances far from me. You have made me an object of loathing to them. I am shut up and cannot go out. My eyes grow uh, dim from misery. I have called upon you every day, Lord. I have spread out my hands to you. David, just a few chapters in, in, in chapter uh, 88 of Psalms, he is sitting there complaining. But by Psalm 96, he says, I'm going to sing a new song. One where I understand who you truly are, oh God. Our new song is not a song that sounds like the world. Do y'all know that? Our new song is not a song that sounds like the world. It is not a, a song so that we can make money. It is not a song that is catchy and repeats the bridges a thousand times until you just cannot stand it anymore. He's saying we need a new perspective. Y'all hear this? We need a new heart. We need a new attitude. What a great lesson for the church at the beginning of a new year. That's right. If this year was filled with misery and heartache and brokenness, you better start singing a new song in 2024. If this past year was filled with bickering and gossiping and high school drama, if this year was filled with anger and hurt and spitefulness, let today be the last day of those songs because tomorrow we're going to sing a new song. And here's what's going to happen, I promise you. If you start singing the song that David is talking about, you know what's going to happen? The world's going to think you're crazy. The world is going to think you are crazy. And you know what I say? Let them think. Amen. Let, let them think. Amen. This time last year, the Kentucky Today uh, published a story about Trinity. And, and in this uh, article, they were talking about us, and it said, <laughs> I just, it came up on my memory, funniest thing in the world. It said, Pastor Abram has been running around like his hair is on fire. That is <laughs> awesome. How funny is that, you know? They think it's my hair. I think it's my heart. But regardless, yeah. guess what? I'm on fire for God. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and I, I truly believe, I truly believe this world has yet to see a church so on fire from, 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 uh, about God, right, that, that hell itself trembles when they hear the Trinity speak. Wouldn't it be a great day when hell itself trembles yes. because Trinity woke up right. and Trinity sat there and had a church right. and Trinity started praying and all the demons would start sh shivering because they're sitting there going, oh no, here they come. I pray we leave here singing God's songs. I, I pray we leave here today singing God's praise. I pray we leave here showing how we have, have seen life change. I pray we leave here so filled with the Holy Spirit that everybody thinks we're crazy. Yes. You know, I, we're, people don't realize, we got, I, I'm, I'm so tickled that we got, I'm, all day long, people, we've been talking about baptisms forever. Well, I've been talking about baptisms to so many people. We're, we got like six baptisms coming up in the next few weeks. So, people are coming to go. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. We even have, we have one gentleman, he's, he's like, I can't, I can't get in there, but I, I'm going to. And he's like, you might, you may have to, it may take me 30 minutes to get up those stairs. He said, I'm going to. Good. Yeah. He said, there might be four of you in there to get me down and back up. He said, I'm going to. And I thought, man, this is something special. This is something special. That is a song that I can get behind. Amen? Amen. The only way we can, can really leave here singing true praise to God, though, is by seeking God's holy face, which is my last, Amen. or my second point. My second point I want to pull from this passage, we have to start seeking. I used, to, I used to hate uh, playing hide and seek when my kids were real little. Have y'all ever played hide and seek? You hide and somebody. Yeah, seek. That's why they call it hide and seek. Pop or game. I'm shocked when nobody knew that. Hide and seek. Play it today, it's real fun. One person hides, or everybody. You can play it that many people you want. Everybody hides, one person seeks. Y'all know what to get? You find it. You find the people that are hiding. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You look for them, you find them, and then you go, ah, I found you. Game over. Man, I didn't know anybody really played that game before. Super easy, super easy. Play with the kids, you can do it with kids. Older people, you always play older people. You know what I'm saying? I almost want to, I, I think River Valley should do a hide and seek at night. <laughs> oh, that'd be scary. <laughs> oh my goodness, but that'd be fun. It'd be really fun. But I used to hate with uh, hide and seek with the kids when they were real little because they did not understand the concept of hide and seek. They always wanted to play it. They always wanted to play it. But they were so little they didn't understand the concept and they would get angry if they, if they were looking for too long. They'd get real mad. Where are you? Why, are you, why, why can't I find you? Uh, they would walk right by you. You'd be hiding.
hiding behind like a curtain and your feet are, are hanging out and then they walk right by me. I'm like, stupid kids, what are you doing? <laughs> I never call my kids stupid, but that's my thought process, okay? And uh, But here's the thing about it. I think this is a lot like the church of 2023. We like the concept of seeking God. Most of you guys are going to read through your Bible in one year starting tomorrow. And you're going to push yourself to get through it. Every day you're going to read those verses to find Christ. And, 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 and well, here's the thing. Most people don't read their Bible in a year to find Christ. They read their Bible in a year just to get through it. Now, now listen, I think it's a great habit to get into, to get reading in your Bible every day. I think it's a beautiful habit. I, think it's a, I encourage it. But don't sit there and just rush through the Bible just to get to the end. Find Christ. Every time you open up that book, find Christ. Right? Don't just do it so you can say you did it. And, and, and here's the thing about hide and seek. It's not until the kids start to grow up and mature a little bit when they finally understand the concept of hide and seek. That they understand the purpose of hide and seek. That they want to find dad. They're, they're going, I get it. I'm going to find him. Then they begin to learn where to look. They, they know which doors to open, which, which closet I'm hiding in. Then they, then, they, then they start realizing that they can just stay quiet long enough I get heavy breathing when I have to walk 10 paces, you know what I'm saying? So they go, if I just quiet long enough, I can hear dad breathing heavily because he can't breathe, you know what I'm saying? All that baby. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so they start understanding the concept. And then they find it all the time. In the same way, when we know where to find God, are you ready? Mm -hmm. When we start to mature in our faith, yeah. we know where to seek them. <laughs> We know God will speak to us through the Bible. We know God will speak to us through prayer. We know God will speak to us in quiet places when we remove all the distractions in our lives. We know God will speak to us when the saints assemble together. We're two or more together. We know this. If you understand who you're truly, truly seeking. That's right. The Bible says that those who know God trust in God. And the Lord has never forsaken those who seek Him. Amen. Oh, how beautiful is that? Amen. Some of you guys are seeking uh, love. In Peter. Okay? Some of you are seeking joy from, from things like uh, get, going on vacation. Some of you are, are looking for peace through drugs or other things like that. Some of you are searching for patience through your own ability. So, some of you search for kindness through your actions. Some of you look for goodness in our government. I don't know who told you to do that. There is nothing good about it. So others look for gentleness to the ones we love. Some of you look towards uh, uh, faithfulness from the church, and none of us seem to have uh, self-control. But here's the thing. What Christ wants us to know and understand is the only way we can experience the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithful, self-control, is if we have the Spirit in us. Amen. If we have the Spirit in us. Right, if you want the fruit of the Spirit, you got to have the Holy Spirit living with inside of you. How do we get the Holy Spirit? By seeking it, by receiving it, by surrendering to our Holy Father. Amen. Look at what it says here in verses 3 through 4 in Psalm 105. It says, May the heart of those who seek the Lord be joyful. You want to know how, you want to, know how to tell somebody's a Christian? Y'all are going to hate this. Y'all going to hate this. You want to know how to tell somebody's a Christian? The heart of those who seek the Lord is joyful. You find somebody joyful, oh boy, their Christianity is not too far behind. Amen. It says in verse 4, seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face continually. You know what it means to seek his face? It means seek his presence. When we say seek his face, we're saying seek his presence. There are moments and seasons in our life where we are not, we're not, we have not abandoned God, we have not left God, but there are seasons in our life where we feel distant from God. Anybody else in there feel that way? Let me tell you something. Uh, uh, we're distant from God when we're distant from his word. We're distant from God when we're distant from our, from our prayers. And there are moments when we need to sit there and stop what we're doing and return to God. Return our hearts to him. And I promise you, many times as you return to God, God's going to have compassion for you. God will have forgiveness for you. God will have mercy and grace for you because God's desire is to be close to his children. And if our desire is not to be close to him, then we will distance ourselves from God. We're going to miss so many blessings that God wants to give us. In order to, in order to return back to God, in order to get close to God, we have to recognize that we're far from him. And I'm telling you guys, some of you are far from him. 
You may play the Christian game real well. You may have, you may have uh, tricked all of us, but some of you guys are so far from God that it's not even fun. You know, I used to work at the return desk at Walmart. Anybody ever been to Walmart? Yeah. yeah. I used to work at, you want to know the worst time to work at Walmart? The week after Christmas. You want to know the worst time to work at the return desk? The week after Christmas. You know what I'm saying? Because everybody comes back to return the presents. You want to know how ungrateful Americans are? You know what I'm saying? Starving kids in Africa? Who cares? We're returning this. Was it the color I liked? You know? My mom got me this sweater. I don't even like it. I heard it all. It was awful. It was terrible. People would wait for 30 minutes in the line and they would cuss me out when they got up to the front. Because I, I made them wait. I said, I made you wait. You're the one here. <laughs> if you were returning everything. And here's, the, here's, the, here's my favorite part. The things that people are returning usually didn't even come from Walmart. Oh. You have a receipt? No. Did you even get it here? No. I am yes. Exactly. <laughs> then the ladies would come with their dresses and, and they'd be like, ah, it doesn't fit. I need to return it. And I'd be like, oh, but the, but the bottom of your dress is dirty. You wore that at, at a Christmas party, didn't you? <laughs> didn't you? I had very little compassion for people at the return desk at Walmart. If that was you this week, I pray for you, you know what I'm saying? But here's my point. I mean, I hate, I hate, I hate working that day. Because everybody, and then you go, if you don't have a receipt, you have to give them a store of credit. They hate that. They want cash. They can go to Target and buy stuff. But uh, here's my favorite thing. Here's the principle. When we return to the Lord, when we seek God, it doesn't matter how many times we come back. Amen. No matter how many times we return to the Lord, he's going to continue to have compassion for his children and forgiveness no matter how many times we do it. Some of you have returned to church, but you haven't returned to God. And some of you have returned, returned to religion, but you haven't returned to God. Let me tell you, it's, it's time we start to seek God. Amen. Return to him. Humble Amen. ourselves and turn from our wicked ways. Here's, what we're, here's where our focus is going to be. If we put our focus on God, we'll start to see his goodness in everything. David tells us in this passage, he says, we got to remember all that God has done. This is my last point. We'll wrap this up. When you get home tonight, read the rest of this chapter, 105 Psalms, right? I want to encourage you to read the rest of it because David starts to list all the things that we should remember. How God's been faithful. How God has never forgotten about his people. How, how, how God cares for every minor detail. At the very end of this chapter, David says three words. Three words we hear all the time. Three words that some of you you guys even say all the time, but it's three words we got to start following. You know what those three words are? Praise the Lord. Amen. I don't know if you saw this this week, but the, uh, Peg, Peg Bean, she's from the, uh, they, they told me for service, the name. Cummings, what is it? McCain's. I call them McCain's, but McCain's. You're right. McCain's. McCain's. Peg from the McCain's. Weird last name, man. Eh? She went home to be the Lord. She died this week. If you if you wanna if you wanna if you wanna get excited and, and find a song that is just super exciting and get you fired up, you look up God of the Mountains on YouTube and, and look up Peg. Peg is the one screaming in the middle of the song. She just starts dancing and screaming. It's one of the most fun things to watch. And I encourage you, God will have to watch it today. And, and here's, here's the thing that I love about this song that they wrote, this family. Here, here's the lyrics. It says, life is easy when you're up on the mountain. And you've got peace of mind like you've never known. But things change when you're down in the valley. Don't lose faith. Amen. For you're never alone. Amen. For the God on the mountain is still God. Yeah. 
they got these uh, bison there. Yeah. How crazy is this? I thought, I thought you gotta go like somewhere far. I told my wife this. Then first service told me, here's what they said. They said you gotta hike to go find. <laughs> so we were gonna go, but I don't wanna do that. So <laughs> But I'd like to see them. I, I wouldn't mind seeing them. I don't know if they'll let me drive something down here and just see them. I just want to see them for a second. Because I think they're one of the most fascinating. They're they're huge. They're 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 like Abram tanks. You ever see those? Named after Abram? <laughs> <laughs> but not only they survive these huge mass killings, but, but these animals can survive some of the craziest weather. One of the most fascinating things about them is, is during the storm, it says the bison are one of the few animals that will actually turn and go into the storm. Right? They're one of the only animals to do this. And the reason they do it is because they know if they go into the storm, they'll come out on the other side quicker. Most animals will sit there and they'll try to outrun it and then they end up staying in the storm for a really long period of time. They, they, they're sitting there, they're afraid of it. But they sit there, the bison will just run right towards it so they can get out. We try so hard in our lives to run from storms and seasons. Anytime something bad happens in our life, we sit there and go, man, I gotta get out of this. I, wanna, I gotta fix this in my own way. I gotta do it. We, we end up finding ourselves in these long periods of hardship for longer because we don't address the storms in our life. We don't surrender those storms to God or tackle them head on. We try to make our own path. When, when the best way to handle storms in our life is to hit them right head on, to address them, to give them over to God and plow through them. And, and, and here's one of the most famous Joshua, in the book of Joshua, Joshua was leading God's people across the Jordan River into the promised land. It was flood season. You know what I'm saying? Everybody remember what a flood season is? Water! Tons of it. It was flood season. And, and, and when the priests would dip their feet in the water, you know, just, when the priests would dip their feet in the water, God would hold back the water and they would be able to cross on, listen, dry land. One moment it was water, they dipped their little toes in, the water would stop and it would be dry, as if water was never there. Amen. And they would be able to, you know, take their carts through there and whatever else, and they wouldn't be stuck in the mud or anything. And God told Joshua to have one person from each of the tribes to get a stone and lay it, you know, lay it on top of each other. And, and you know what he called those? He called those stones of remembrance. So they would never forget what was done there and who did it. Amen. I, 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 I think it would be the greatest idea. Nobody liked it first service you ever heard. You're love it. I, I love you guys, and you guys are my best service. <laughs> I always, I said, what would it, would it have been, wouldn't it be a great idea if we got a big old boulder and stuck it outside? Bah! We could get somebody to engrave what, what all God did in 2019. Then we get another big old boulder, put, put on top of that, bah! We get somebody to, I don't know who, I don't know if you even can engrave, but you engrave in the stone, or chisel. And you put in there all that God did in 2020. Then we get another ball. Bah! We engrave it now. What God did. You know what I'm saying? Y'all get my point? Yeah. Yeah. Then this year we put one down. Bah! We put what God did in 2023. And the next year. Bah! We put in what God's going to do in 2024. Stones of remembrance. Yes. Yeah. I think this would be such a great idea. Because... We have a problem in our churches. Not just ours, everywhere. We forget what God has done. We forget when God moves in a big and powerful way. We forget how, how blessed we are as a church. You, our problem is we're so quick to forget that. I, I was thinking about this this week. People get so upset with me when I start talking about, you know, all you talk about is what happened in 2019 and today. There's a reason. I never want anybody in this church to forget how far we've come. Right. Amen. Amen. That's right. If you would have told me five years ago that not only would we have enough money to financially re renovate our sanctuary, listen, financially renovate our sanctuary, and then we just got our, 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 our uh, uh, anonymous donor check this week. So this week we're going to be donating 50, almost 50 grand to our community all in the same year. Yeah. Renovate our, our entire sanctuary. Amen. Yeah. Raise 50 grand to set their hand across the Only God yeah. can do that. Amen. We didn't have.
have any money to do the renovations? No. All it paid for. Lord. We didn't have any money to give out to the community. All it paid for. That's what God is doing. Exactly. He says, Him. We have to remember these things. We have to remember these things. Life is too short not to remember the goodness of God. I'll, I'll end with this. On, on New Year's Eve, 1999. Anybody remember that? Oh, gosh. I know some of y'all should because y'all are old enough. 1999. What's that Prince song? Gonna party like it. 1999. Let me tell you something that was happening in 1999. A little boy named Aiden Broder. 1999 on New Year's Eve. You wanna know what I was doing in 1999 on New Year's Eve? I was crying. On New Year's Eve, 1999, because of a thing called Y2K. It was supposed to be the end of the world. The world was gonna end as soon as the, the, the clock strikes midnight. And so I spent my New Year's Eve scared to death about 2000, the year 2000. And uh, if, if, it, if it didn't end that time, then the robots were going to take over. It was a weird, you think about a kid thinking that way. It was a weird thought process, you know what I'm saying? Nobody seemed to care in my house except for me. You know what I'm saying? Shouldn't we be in a bunker? Shouldn't we be in the basement? Shouldn't we be doing something? No, we're, we're sitting there watching, uh, who's that, Nick Van Dyke sitting there, old, old guy, he's old in 99, just sitting there talking to us. It was weird. Unbelievable. Is that the right guy? Dick Clark. Dick Clark. Dick Clark. <laughs> I don't know who the guy I just talked to. Yeah, Dick Clark is sitting there, old, old as Methuselah, sitting there. What's <laughs> wrong with you doing over here? Bless us. Rest his soul, let's say that. But anyway, 1999, I remember counting. Have you ever, uh, uh, not very many of you have ever counted down to your death, but I did. <laughs> Ten. Nine. You know? As soon as it got to zero, the whole house was dark. My cousin turned off all the light, shut off all the light. How stupid is that? Gave me a heart attack. Worst, worst year of my life. Thankfully, nothing came out of it, and I slept like a baby that night. But uh, here, here's my question, uh, and then we'll, we'll close. But if tonight was was the last night for you, if when, if when that clock struck midnight tonight, it was all over for you, can you sit there and say that you've given your life to Christ? Can you sit there and say that heaven's going to be your home? Or are you sitting there going, hey, I've got, I got some things i got to get in order. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If God is, is moving in your life right now, if God is, has been moving over the last couple of weeks, maybe you're realizing today that you've been pretending to be a Christian, but you're not. Or maybe you're seeking for all the wrong things in life, and you're sitting there thinking, you know, maybe there's something to this Jesus thing. Let me, let me, I, want, I want to encourage you to do something. All right? Because here's what you got to understand about, about your, uh, your old pastor, Abel. I told somebody this on Thursday. Uh, we were talking about the church and, and the, the kingdom impact that, that we're having at this church. You know what I told him? I said, I said, Here's the funny thing that people don't realize, and I don't want anybody to be offended by this, but I want you to hear my heart. If nobody showed up today, guess what? I'd still be preaching. Amen. Did y'all realize that? Amen. If you guys were like, if tomorrow you said, you know what, bro? We want to, we'd rather Andrew just leave the day, and y'all, you know, you get kicked off to the curb, and you can, and you can preach better than us just have him do it. You, guess what I would still be doing? I'd still be preaching. You, you have to understand, I'll be preaching. If it's at another church, I'll be preaching at another church. If, if, if no church wanted any closure, guess what? I'd be on the street corner, preaching on the street corner. If they kick me off the street corner for preaching out in public, guess what? I'd get on Facebook and I'd start preaching online. There is nothing that would stop me from preaching. You understand what I'm saying? Because God has called me to do this. Now, what I did not realize for the longest time is not everybody has that same drive or passion or heart when it comes to God. And I also believe that every single person sitting here, it, it could have that ability. You could have that passion and drive. I, I believe in the priesthood of the believer that God has called all of us to evangelize, to witness to those who are far from God. We're all called to be completely sold out to Christ. But it takes a total surrender in order to do that. So I want you to know Christ is so close to each and every one of you here today. He is working in your heart here today. But you have to surrender to him. And let me say this, but the longer that you wait, the harder your heart is going to be. And so with every, with every head bowed and every eyes closed, every head bowed and every eyes closed, if you're here today and you're ready to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to pray this prayer. And listen, this is not a prayer of rededication. Some of you guys keep rededicating your life over and over and over and over again. It's not working. Because you think the motions of salvation save you, but it doesn't. It doesn't matter.
matter how many times you come down the aisle, how many times you've been baptized, it doesn't matter how many times you repeat the prayer. Romans 10, 13 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Our salvation is secure. So if there's somebody here that they don't have Christ in their heart, you're sitting here going, look, I don't, I don't know if I'm saved. I don't know if the clock struck midnight and life was over tonight. I don't know if I'd be in heaven. I want you to pray this prayer. Listen, I'm not, a, I'm not a priest or anything. This prayer cannot come from me. This has to come from your heart, and you have to mean it. Every hand bowed, every eyes closed. If you're ready to receive Christ in your heart, say this prayer. Say, Jesus, I need you. And Jesus, I repent of my sins. Today, God, I give you my life. I give you control. Rescue me, Jesus. Save me right here, right now. Forgive my sin. I'm all yours and I'm all in. Here I am, Jesus. Take my life. Lead, guide, and direct me. Thank you, God, for sending your son to save a wretch like me. And here today, I promise to follow you all the days of my life. Eyes still closed, heads still bowed. If you prayed that prayer and actually meant what you prayed, not because I prayed it, but because you actually understood what it meant. We close in a word of prayer, and after that prayer, I want you to boldly stand up. Without hesitating, after my prayer, I want you to come forward so we can pray with you, celebrate what God is doing, talk about next steps. But do not walk out of this place without getting your life right with God. Dear Christmas Father, we're so thankful for this glorious day you've given us. 